Good day, and welcome to the Plant Engineering Webcast, How Talent and Technology Revolutionize Industrial Maintenance, sponsored by Advanced Technology Services, or ATS, a leading provider of industrial maintenance and MRO, that is maintenance, repair, and operations services. I'm your moderator, Kevin Parker, and I have, I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Plant Engineering. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slide or audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you are having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Type questions for our speakers in the Ask a Question box on the left-hand side of the screen. The live Q&A session will begin immediately after the presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded you will receive an email within one week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion, a PDF copy of the presentation, and other additional resources, use the Event Resources tab on the left-hand side of your screen. Those documents will also be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. I'd now like to introduce today's presenters, Jim Frainer and Jeff Kosirik. Jim Frainer is a Senior Director at Advanced Technology Services and has over 25 years of experience working with leading discrete and process manufacturers across industries to provide solutions for their industrial maintenance and MRO challenges. He is currently focused on working with enterprise level customers to help develop strategies for improving reliability within their manufacturing operations while dealing with a very large skilled trades gap we have globally. Jeff Kosurik is a Vice President at Advanced Technology Services. He is responsible for market research and business intelligence gathering across manufacturing and the industrial sector. This includes data monitoring, analysis, and forecasting industry trends. Prior to joining ATS in 2014, Jeff served in leadership roles at Siemens and Schneider Electric. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. The floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Kevin, for that introduction. I uh, really appreciate it. And I especially want to thank everybody uh, who's joining us today for this webinar. Uh, I know it's a bit challenging these days with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're all running in a lot of different directions, but we appreciate your time in joining us today. Uh, Funny story, just this morning, um, I have an older daughter who uh, is in high school, and they're really good about communicating to the parents, and they sent out a newsletter, and they always have an inspirational quote, and today's quote was from, um, if you can believe it, Dolly Parton, and the quote was, the way I see it, if you want the rainbow, you got to put up with the rain, and boy, the past few weeks, we've, uh, we've seen a lot of rain. We all really, really appreciate you folks joining us today, and I hope everybody is staying safe. As we look through the agenda for today, folks, um, you know, our, our subject, how talent and technology revolutionize industrial maintenance. Um, we've really broken that out into three key areas here we're going to get into. And as we look at this study in and of itself, uh, I'm just going to give a quick backgrounder, you know, for those folks who, who may not uh, have, have heard of the study or maybe you haven't seen this study uh, yet this year. In the March issue of Plant Engineering, uh, they do profile this study, and they have for many, many years. And this is actually the fifth year that ATS has been the sponsor for this research study. And we really appreciate Kevin and the rest of the folks over at Plant Engineering and CFE Media uh, for putting together this great content. You know, we, uh, we utilize this, this uh, research in many different ways at ATS, and we know that a lot of our customers do as well. And throughout the next hour or so, Jim and I are going to talk to uh, some of these key topics that we found in this research, uh, but more importantly, some of the, uh, some of the anecdotes and um, some of the other trends that we're seeing across the manufacturing space. 
For those folks that might not be aware of ATS or who we are, uh, as Kevin alluded to, we are a leading solutions provider. We've got over 35 years of experience in reliability-centered industrial maintenance and MRO services. Uh, we operate in hundreds of factories across the U.S., Mexico, and the U.K., and these factories use our talent and technologies to reduce downtime, experience greater productivity, and, of course, measure results, and we're going to get into that in more detail. Um, our perspective here, and this is really the tenets of our corporate culture at ATS, uh, living safety, valuing employees, engaging customers, and driving results. And we all rally our, our, uh, all of our employees at ATS, all of our customers. We rally around these, and I think folks do appreciate that. A lot of the experiences you're going to hear Jim and I talking to uh, throughout the webinar today uh, lead into several different industries. And if you look at these industries we have on the screen here, I'd say most, if not all, of our customers and experiences are going to draw from these. So you can expect to hear kind of a wide range of uh, focus topics as we're talking here. And we're really going to apply it to be uh, focused around some different industries. And I think you'll, um, you'll get a lot out of those anecdotes that we, that we do share throughout this webinar. Uh, another resource here, we're going to talk about some of the resources made available um, at the end of this uh, presentation, but um, some of the resources that we're going to pull from, too, is from the Manufacturing Leadership Council, and I'm not sure if um, everybody's aware of who they are. Uh, we sure are. ATS has been a member of, of the Manufacturing Leadership Council uh, and still are today uh, as part of the National Association of Manufacturers. When you look across their critical issues, uh, Journey of Manufacturing 4.0, uh, factories of the future. Um, a lot of the critical issues they're talking about today are also critical issues that are found in this plant engineering study. So we see a lot of synergy happening in the industry, and we're going to draw from that as we go through uh, the presentation for you folks today. Just as a baseline, uh, Kevin kind of introed the, uh, the study here and the effort, but just as a baseline, I just wanted to show you some of the demographics uh, that, uh, that are happening throughout the study here. Um, you can see here that 80% uh, of the respondents of this study, and, and I'm sure a lot of you folks dialed in today uh, probably took this survey, uh, a lot of you folks fall into that engineering, maintenance, and supervisory camp. So we've got a lot of great experience here, uh, as well as about 19% of the people who do fall into kind of general management roles, uh, VPs, uh, treasurers, GMs, et cetera. So um, great audience for this, and, and we appreciate you taking the survey, and we appreciate that you're with us here today. And then as we look at industry experience here uh, of the folks who did take this survey, the average is 23 years experience. So we've got a lot of good, uh, I think, baseline for, for the answers that were in this study. And, uh, you know, if you compile that with the folks who uh, have 30 to 39 years or even 40 years or longer of experience, you know, we're looking at about two-thirds of the folks that, that took this study. So we, we, we love to see that. We love to hear the experiences. Um, and we're going to drop on those as we kind of share some of, uh, some of our story and the stories of some of our customers throughout our time together today. As I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to be focused on three key areas here. Of course, this research study spanned the gamut of many, many different topics. But we thought if we could key in on these three topics and give you some, uh, some, some industry experiences, some anecdotes, um, some of the trends that we're seeing. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, some of the main pressures and objectives that are happening within plants today. We're going to be talking about key initiatives across manufacturing. What are those uh, things that are kind of rising to the surface in terms of uh, focal areas and key initiatives? And then finally, we're going to be talking about some of the implications for maintenance and reliability services. So once we define those, what does this all mean as it relates to things like uh, technology, uh, the, the changing workforce, some of the habits that we all have? And with that, we're going to kick off the first section here of pressures and objectives found in manufacturing. And for the moment, I'm going to turn it back over to Jim. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about it, pressures and challenges and objectives that businesses have, but not necessarily from a technical or, or a plant perspective, which you see here. I'm going to try to talk a little bit more uh, broad brush, maybe from a macro perspective. So. You know, one of the things that's, that we see across the industry today is uh, in manufacturing, uh, there's, a, there's an acronym that people talk about, and it's VUCA or VUCA. Uh, it stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, Ambiguous. 
I think that really describes what's happening in business and industry today. Um, but specifically for manufacturing, some of the, the large pressures that they're seeing are trade uncertainty, obviously, uh, some in more industries than more in some industries than others. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of innovation, whether that's tech, technology advancements in, on the process side of things, or even on on products and applications. And we're really seeing a, a pretty fast rate of change with competitors. We're seeing a lot of market disruption. Uh, distribution channels are changing. And manufacturers are having to respond to all of those pressures. And uh, you know what we're seeing across the industries that we support uh, are, are common challenges around, uh, at the plant level, selecting and deploying technology. Uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that here today. Uh, obviously, reducing unplanned losses and downtime, that's, uh, that's an ongoing battle and uh, obviously identified up, up here in the graph. Um, and, I, and I think especially in the, in the maintenance and reliability space, um, we're really feeling challenged around cost and getting resources and, and continue to support and fight for those resources we need come budget time. Uh, and then also, uh, we're seeing some unique challenges, I believe, that are technology driven and that's around job roles. Uh, I do believe there are some, some job roles that are changing uh, in, in these plants. How does maintenance get done? How does engineering and operations get done? And we'll talk a little bit more about that here as well. Um, you know, these are, these are really just my perspective, so why don't we uh, go ahead and take a look at what some of the survey respondents said. Um, obviously, you know, this slide talks about key challenges to improving maintenance. I'm sure the audience here can relate to each of these challenges on the chart. You know, when I look at it, I, I see a very common theme. It really boils down to, to resources, money, people, tools and systems, time. You know, these, these are all resources that, that we are competing for within the organizations that we work for. Yeah, and of course, as pressures to reduce costs continue, um, uh, that comes from business leaders. Uh, it's very uncommon to see internal maintenance organizations, I'm sorry, it's very common to see internal maintenance organizations become underfund, underfunded as a result of these, these challenges. Now, sometimes uh, maintenance organizations are only able to provide the most basic functions and, and that's many, many times in a highly reactive environment. You know, when this happens, all efforts to transform and, and innovate and drive improvements they really suffer, and uh, in some cases, they stop altogether. Um, you know, the skilled labor shortage obviously is another challenge here in the U.S., and and this complicates an already difficult situation for uh, maintenance and reliability leaders um, in the plants and across these organizations. What I've seen consistently, uh, really across every industry segment, is this: the M&R leaders who seem to get the best results for their plants year over year are those who are, are really best prepared to support and defend a really strong business case for these resources. You know, it's, it, it's most evident, obviously, during budget cycles, but um, I would say those folks that, that seem to get the best results also actively work with other functional groups and key stakeholders within their organizations, whether it's operations, quality, HR, finance, what have you, uh, to really try to calibrate and uh, uh, collaborate uh, these for these resources. You know, if um, if we, most of us, I believe, on the call are, are maintenance and reliability leaders, if we don't have a firm grasp, really, of, of how to do this within our organizations, uh, how to how to get these resources and address these challenges, it can be extremely difficult to make progress. Uh, what's been really immensely helpful for for our teams, um, and Jeff talked about this a moment ago. Um, is that we've established these, these four pillars, and uh, they're pillars of our culture, and we use them to keep us and our teams, uh, both corporate leadership and also at the plant level, focused on what's important. And um, they're really guides that we use for alloc allocating resources at our plants and in our business every day. Um, you know, Jeff framed it up earlier, the, the pillars are live safety, value employees, engage customers, and drive results. You know, when, when we make decisions in our business, our executive leaders reinforce that all of our decisions and our investments really must be grounded in one of these pillars. And if they don't, the odds of getting uh, support uh, for an initiative or getting resources are, are pretty slim. Um, <clears throat> the, the question, I guess, here for the group today that I would ask is, 
do, do you, and more importantly probably, do your teams know and understand what those pillars are for your business? Um, obviously, ours probably aren't a fit for yours, but you know, if not, really taking time to establish and communicate and reinforce whatever those critical few are will, will really help simplify the efforts to, to rally folks around common business and, and, in our case, cultural objectives. You know, it also helps alleviate a lot of the complexity of framing up a business case when you know what, uh, you know, what, what the, the priorities are for the organization, and it, it really helps folks connect the dots between the problem they're trying to solve out there and, and the resources that they're, they're, that they're asking for. Um, <clears throat> Jeff talked about this here a minute ago, too. You know, in the resource section, we do have some links that, that will talk about uh, how other companies have done this and, and how they go about budgeting and, and allocating resources with, within the organization. There's a lot of really good information there. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, you know, the next slide also has some interesting responses relative to, to how many of these challenges are impacting downtime according to the survey respondents. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at that real quick. Um, you know, as you look at this, you know, as you might expect, the, the leading causes of downtime as identified by all the participants is, is pretty varied, and they each have unique challenges. Um, if there was an easy solution to, to really to any of these, I'm sure probably somebody on the call would have probably already figured it out. So these are, these are complex issues. You know, the good news is um, in our industry and, and where we are today uh, overall with technology, whether that's hardware or software, um, you know, the solutions in the marketplace have never been better, and they're really getting more affordable, it seems like, every day. Um, what we've also noticed, and uh, I think what's been a huge help for us and others, is the technology is becoming much easier to deploy, much user-friendly, much more user-friendly. Uh, for example, some sensors that we, that we have available today uh, utilize Bluetooth technology and Wi-Fi. Uh, it's really easy to uh, exchange data with an iPad or some other type of tablet device. Um, th this certainly makes the sampling and, and acquisition of data much easier. Uh, it reduces some of the labor burden that we typically see in plants to go do, you know, typical PDM routes and those kind of things. Um, and one of the things I've seen really develop here in the last couple of years is wearable technology, um, where um, folks out on the shop floor actually put devices on their person, and it, it helps companies better direct employees when they do their work uh, in, as far as error proofing. Uh, and obviously, there are some challenges that come with that, but I've seen that deployed, and the, the initial, uh, initial feedback is it works pretty well. Um, you know, as I've said previously, I, I do think Technology is a, is a great thing today, but I do see it more as a folk force multiplier. Um, that, that's kind of my term for it. it really helps us do our job better, uh, more than really the answer to uh, you know, all of our problems and all these things that are listed on this chart. Um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of folks that, that believe it's a panacea that's going to solve all these issues, and, and it's really not. Um, you know, the, the bad news, I guess, is for, for those of us in the, the, the maintenance and reliability leader position. Uh, the teams will need to continue to address these problems, um, obviously ones caused by aging equipment, engineering issues and design flaws and those kind of things. Um, if you have critical assets that, that really are at the end of the life or maybe some that have just been really poorly maintained, um, you might consider uh, doing what we refer to as a machine health assessment. Um, these machine health assessments are really a deep dive into identifying what some of the potential critical failure modes are for that asset. Um, it can really help you develop some risk mitigation plans and you know, how you're going to deal with major repairs and obsolete components. Um, you know, machine health assessment, what we found is, is also very helpful when it comes time for us to articulate to our, to our customers, in this case plant managers and those kind of folks, um, what the, the business risks are of continue to operate this equipment. And we, we use that to help them make really good and good uh, good decisions. And we we uh, we do that with really proven diagnostic tools. So it's not just a conversation of opinions. We've got data and facts and and uh, and things to back that up. So I'd encourage if, if you're continuing to struggle to struggle with aging assets and those kind of things in your plants, consider a machine health assessment uh, for for some of those components. Um, you know, also, we've had some success with, uh, with some of these 
pieces of equipment, adding sensors, and, and using those to really more closely monitor performance. Um, in some cases, it's also helped us reduce our technicians' exposure to get access to some of the areas of the equipment that uh, may be either you know, too hot, too cold, or have some, some kind of space limitation. So there are some really, um, really good sensing options out in the market today that are pretty affordable for those kind of applications. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, this information and the things we're talking about here have been helpful. I expect uh, a lot of folks are, are seeing some of the same thing, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A section to get, maybe dive deeper into any of these, uh, any of these elements. So um, with that, um, oh, thank you. With that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Jim, for your uh, perspective on that. Um, certainly a lot going on, you know, when you, you look across that wide spectrum and, and try to tackle, you know, from, from the big picture, just uh, improving maintenance overall uh, within the factory environment, and then dealing with things such as unscheduled downtime, um, workplace challenges, et cetera. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, we've been sponsoring this, this study now for five years, and we've got access to some great data and trends one of the critical insights um, that, we, that we looked at here is we saw the percentage of plants that follow a plan maintenance strategy uh, between 2015 and 2020 um, has actually gone down by, by nine points, um, which, which is kind of an interesting statistic here. So Jim, maybe a question to you, you know, why would you think that is? Why, did, why is that trend currently happening? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, I uh, when I look at this, Jeff, I my first reaction is, wow, it's a shame with with all the technology and everything going on. You would expect it and hope it would go the other way, but but I'll tell you, um, here's here's my thoughts. Again, I don't know that it's the right answer, but when I look at the dates and I look at the trend, you know, I think about what was going on in the U.S. during this time. You know, unemployment was trending down to I think what ended up being 40-year lows, certainly before all that the COVID-19 stuff started. You know, our economy in the U.S. was very strong. Um, also, we had some, some pretty impressive capacity utilization numbers. I think they were in the high 70s, and, and those were really the, the highest numbers we'd seen since the, the kind of the Great Recession of 08. Now, personally, I believe the, the experience that, um, that some of us had with plants, certainly I know our folks did, we saw really high turnover rates in key leadership positions like plant management and, and even some um, some general management positions. Um, you know, this turnover in key leadership can really be challenging. And, and for us it was certainly, and I expect it was for, for some on the call. Um, the result really ends up being a lot more focus on short-term type initiatives and activities. Uh, you know, most manufacturers were really focused on, on maximizing output as well during, um, during kind of this booming economic time. And uh, some manufacturers, I believe, made a choice to assume a little more risk in terms of reliability to try to get uh, higher production volumes out. So I think that's, that's affecting the numbers, Jeff. Also, uh, you know, our organization had to adapt to this, and, and I expect everybody was kind of in the same boat here. We, we learned that, you know, our maintenance and reliability leaders had to become very good and very proactive with all of their communications. We had to be very quick to engage uh, new plant leaders when they would come in, uh, make sure that they understood uh, where maintenance performance had been historically, where it was currently, and certainly where we were trying to take it, all in support of helping the plant and the factory run better. Um, we had some new plant leaders who were really good and supported the strategies at, at many of our plants, and uh, we also had those that only wanted to hear from us or hear about maintenance you know, when there was a problem. Um, all of this organiza organizational churn that we saw during this time, um, you know, if, it, if it's not managed properly, it's just another great example of that acronym we talked about earlier, VUCA, right? It's uncertainty. It's, uh, it's a bit chaotic. So, um, you know, that's my perspective, Jeff. I, I really would look forward to hearing some other perspectives from the group as well. Um, but I look forward to getting to that in the Q&A section. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jim, for your perspective there. I, I do agree. You know, there's, there's just lots of moving parts these days. And, you know, as we, as we wrap up this section here, you know, you just said it best, you know, volati volatility and uncertainty, you know, are, are upon us. Uh, even in good economic conditions, obviously, those folks that are going to persevere, those folks that are going to win, 
um, they always operate under uncertainty. And I think with with the uh, the new world that we're that we're in here and, and some of the undiscovered uh, territory that's to come, uh, that's going to continue. Uh, resource allocation, I think, is also key. You know, you touched on that throughout here relative to to the improvements of maintenance organizations. Uh, and then validating the business case, you know, when you look at um, operations and maintenance within the factories today, uh, being able to quantify the, the impact that you're having in dollars uh, is key. And, and Jim, you had talked about the importance of that, you know, for, for budgeting purposes, um, especially uh, important with, with production support, production equipment maintenance. So appreciate your responses to those and, um, and uh, love the, the direction we're going here. For the, uh, for the second part here, um, we we're going to talk about some of the key initiatives that we're seeing happening around, uh, around manufacturing, um, some of the things we're seeing, you know, some of the different offerings that ATS has relative to outsource maintenance. And Jim's going to walk us through uh, a couple more pieces of data from the plant engineering study and then provide some perspective uh, from, from what we're seeing out there. So, Jim, if you wouldn't mind walking us through some more of your, uh, your thoughts. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, th this question that, that everybody sees up here is, is simply you know, asking the survey group why an outsourcing, or outsourcing initiative would be uh, supported in their organizations. Um, I'm sure nobody here is really surprised at the top two answers that are on the chart. Uh, you know, there, there really is um, no question that maintenance and reliability budgets are limited and that skilled labor shortages have been a real problem in the U.S. for many years. Um, you know, in our experience, the, the rationale for outsourcing, though, goes well beyond just the scarcity of, of labor. Um, of the 100 plus plants that we're supporting today, almost every single customer made some kind of an investment, usually in the form of additional labor, in an attempt to improve performance prior to exploring an outsourced option. Um, what I believe is, is through this process, they learned how the efficiency and effectiveness of, of the available labor can really be hindered by things like uh, poor planning, lack of clear KPIs and metrics, um, ineffective or, or poorly run storerooms and, and, and critical spares availability, uh, you know, work execution management, um, how work gets done in the maintenance environment is huge. Um, you know, I think most folks that have gone down this path have really realized that the additional resources they put forth just in the labor area were were marginalized due to all these other limitations and challenges they've had. And, I, and I'm sure that's not news to the folks here on the call today. Uh, we've seen technician utilization losses as high as 30 or 40 percent simply due to really poor supply chain practices and, and spare parts. Uh, things like unorganized incomplete technical libraries, disorganized maintenance work areas, and, and really poor management of shared tools, those things can make those numbers even higher. Um, here at ATS, we, we've really built a, a great company around our what we refer to as our comprehensive outsource maintenance solution. But you know what we're finding is that many companies are really doing the right things. Many companies have been going down the path, and they've got a solid strategy. They've got good systems. Um, they're they're adopting new technology, but they they still can continue to struggle with that that talent side, uh, whether it's acquiring talent, training the talent, or retaining the talent. Now, as a result of this, one of the things we've done is, is we've uh, worked with customers to um, let them continue to manage their strategy, continue to really own all of those components, and really lean on us for our capabilities around hiring, training, and retaining that kind of talent. Uh, obviously, we also have a very strong safety culture here. Um, you know, these, these customers may choose in some cases to retain some maintenance functions in-house and then have us come in as a, as a support function. Um, you know, we, refer the, we call this today our Technical Workforce Solution, or TWS. And, um, you know, it's, it's I think, going to be a wave of the future. I think most companies are going to need to find a partner to help them deal with, with the skilled labor shortage and a lot of these other issues. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure I could talk longer about all this stuff than, than most people care to listen. So now let's go ahead and have a look at the next one. And, and this, this next slide shows some of the plans being put in action by the survey respondents to really Im improve their downtime performance. Um, now th this chart, as I look at it, um, 
it's really encouraging to me. I see a large percentage of the survey respondents are acknowledging that you know, strategy for maintenance is important. Clearly, for the reasons stated earlier, maintenance organizations um, uh, just may not may not be able to continue operating the way they have for the last five plus years. Um, it just changes is paramount. We're going we're all going to have to figure out how to adapt uh, as technology changes and as the market changes. Um, re regarding upgrading equipment, uh, you know, what, what I would say, probably starting for us and, and many of our customers around 2017 or 2018, we saw an increased willingness by a, a lot of companies to invest significant capital into new manufacturing assets, uh, which obviously is, is fantastic. You know, however, very seldom was downtime or reliability issues one of the top drivers for making the decision about which asset to replace or, or uh, how those upgrades were done. You know, in most cases, it was tied to the obvious. Um, capability improvements that maybe enhance some flexibility, capacity improvement that, that helped them with utilization, or just a, a, a very clear cost or efficiency gain in their business. Um, you know, I think eliminating old and, and unreliable assets certainly is a uh, move in the right direction and, and will be a help. But I, I do think most plants um, will still con continue to have to battle some of these constrained assets or bad actors. And, and I would suggest that, um, you know, just in replacing equipment by itself isn't going to be a, a complete strategy. You know, the, the topic also um, around training comes up quite often in, uh, in our conversations with with manufacturing leaders. Uh, if you have high, a high level of turnover in your maintenance team, and, and some people may argue that training won't deliver results, that uh, you're really just training your folks for their next job at another company. Um, I, I, I'll give you my opinion on that here in a minute. Um, we, we also see that training dollars are really difficult to justify. Um, it, it's really tough for, for folks to show a, a tangible ROI on training. And if you've ever done it, you, you probably know what I mean. Uh, what I've seen as a result of that across many organizations is they revert to what I call kind of the peanut butter approach to training. They, they spread it all around the organization real evenly and try to make sure everybody gets a little bit, and uh, you know, that's the, the extent of their training plan. Um, and, and I think, you know, I'm not faulting people for doing that, but um, without a real understanding of the, the very specific gaps that exist among the team, um, it's really difficult to put all that together. Uh, my advice to the group here is when it, when it comes to evaluating training, the place to start is looking at the, the assets that you have, do an assessment of the equipment and the technology that you have in your plant, and, and start to think about the types of skills and the capabilities your team is going to need to support that equipment. Uh, the second thing would be to really do a take the time and do a formal skills assessment with your team. Um, we have a tool that we use for that. There, there are several out there. Uh, our tool happens to be a very standardized and proctored test, so it, we get very accurate, very thorough results. Um, these two things, I would say, uh, are key to helping us really have and, and develop an, indiv an individual training plan for every technician. Uh, and it's something that, that the folks on the call can do today. Um, I fully appreciate that very few maintenance organizations today have in-house training teams complete with all the industrial training curriculum and training assets at their disposal like we do. Um, but, but this is something you can really lean on a supplier to develop, and, and we have quite a few of our training resources that our customers are taking advantage of today. So uh, that's my, my thoughts on the training piece. Um, you know, re regarding the challenge that I talked about earlier, uh, you're, you're really just training people for, for their next job. Um, I think that's kind of short-sighted. I, I can tell you that training, at least in, in the, the industrial maintenance space, is absolutely a key satisfier or you know, potentially dissatisfier if you don't do it, but a key satisfier. And our teams really like the fact that, that we're proactive and they, they have access to that training. And when done properly, a good, robust training program can absolutely help your retention numbers. Um, you know, it, it, kind of to sum it up in a nutshell, I believe leaders here on the phone and, and in their respective industries will probably do it, have to do a combination of all the things that are, that are listed here on this chart to really drive results. 
Uh, you know, my advice here is that very few organizations will be able to accomplish all of these things internally by themselves. You know, I, I think maintenance and reliability leaders need to take an active role in um, forming some key supplier relationships with companies that can help you accomplish your plans faster and maybe with greater success certainly than you could you could probably do on your own. If you're if you're fortunate and you've got peers who are responsible for sister plants in your organization, you know, a, a little collaboration can go a long, long way. <clears throat> Leveraging implementation costs for things like training and, and other initiatives can can make the cost more manageable. Um, and also adding scale to some of these things can really help make for a, a really strong ROI for the business. Um, you know, I'm going to wrap up this section uh, by talking briefly about you know, the maturity of your, your maintenance organizations and how that may come into play with some of the things that, that folks are looking to try to drive. So I'm going to, I'm going to go on to the next one and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I'm sure folks here have seen a continuum like this or, or, or maybe the same one at some point. You know, the comment I have here is that if you happen to be responsible for a plant that is in a highly reactive state, you should really focus your improvement efforts on maintenance planning and, and really good work execution management um, and, and PMs, obviously. Um, we have found it, it's really difficult for a highly reactive team to you know, make the initial transition from reactive to preventive and proactive um, without some kind of surge or some kind of uh, resource up front to help build momentum and establish that change. Um, this case, you know, um, in this case, obviously, safety is key. Rallying your people, getting them to understand and, and get behind the change uh, is key. So in, in that situation, I, I don't believe a pure technology play is going to drive the best results. Um, and that's just kind of been our experiences. Obviously, you, you want to do everything, but we all have limited resources that we have to work with. Um, you know, we've also accepted the fact, um, and, and obviously, as Jeff, as Jeff said, we've got a lot of plants all over the U.S., Mexico, and the U.K. Um, talent in the industry is, is a very scarce resource. Uh, um, obviously, the current crisis uh, changes things a bit. Hopefully, this is going to be a quick recovery, but I do believe that's going to continue to be the case. Um, while you may attempt or, or like the idea of having a whole team of senior technicians and controls engineers who can really come in and fix any problem you might have in the plant, uh, it's just not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> what we've done is, is we've really tried to use technology in the form of our CMMS. Uh, we have a, what's called a technology hub. Um, we have uh, portals that our folks use to um, talk about specific technical challenges that, that, that we're having across the organization and various plants. Uh, we also have a, an SME or a subject matter expert network that we've developed so our folks know who to reach out to when they have a specific problem. <clears throat> um, while this isn't you know, traditionally thought of as a technology play, it really is. This capability is something our teams use every day. It helps us resolve complex problems for our customers. Um, it really does help avoid delays. I think a lot of plants default to calling an OEM when they when they get stuck or there's a problem. Um, and today, obviously, with the COVID-19 crisis, that's uh, that's just not an option. Um, you know, in summary, I guess I'll just kind of suggest here: uh, be realistic with what your current state is. Um, leverage the heck out of the suppliers and other resources uh, you can get your hands on um, as you start to build a plan to work along the continuum. Uh, at least that is once things kind of start to come back to normal here. So um, those are my thoughts on on the strategy and, and how that kind of fits. Um, Jeff, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jim, for those for those insights. Um, you know, certainly, again, you know, the, we run the gamut of um, of all these topics running through maintenance and operations within factories, and um, you know, we look back, you know, for the for the case of the study here you know, over the past five years again. And one of the critical insights that jumped out at us, you know, relative to the subject at hand, was we looked at the percentage of responders that see maintenance as a cost center, uh, really just to keep the equipment running and, and to, to control these costs. And obviously for those folks that, that may have um, a more, um, some might say focused or reliability-centered maintenance program, 
you know, they would see maintenance more as, as a profit center or a value driver uh, for the organization. So what, what do you think, you know, the fact that from 2015 we had 55% and in 2020 we're at 59%, what, what do you think this trend is showing us? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, and I, I would say it reflects what, uh, what we see certainly across the industries that we're supporting today. Now, I think, Jeff, what this, what this also, also tells me, and, and I think should probably tell everybody, is most manufacturers still have, I guess, what I would call somewhat of an old-school view of the maintenance function. You know, I, I think it's important that as, as maintenance and reliability leaders, we really need to start talking and really thinking differently about you know, this business of maintenance. Um, you know, recently, during a conversation uh, I had with an executive leader from one of our customers' organizations, um, he offered to me that, that we, as, as the maintenance provider in his plant, we don't really deliver maintenance services. And I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. It got my attention. And he said, you know, our efforts are really more about delivering predictable capacity to his operations. Now, I thought about that term, and I, and I thought it really framed up the efforts nicely. I think we've got to be thinking differently and, and, and change perceptions in, in, in all of our uh, manufacturing organizations about what maintenance is, how it works, and uh, the value it brings to the organization. And uh, it's really not a cost that needs to be minim really needs to be minimized, which again is a, a, is a common thought process, especially at budget time. Um, when you start to look at companies that that are considered best in class and are, are benchmarks when it comes to operating efficiency and capacity utilization and reliability, they really have changed the perspective around how they view the maintenance function entirely. Uh, leading companies are <clears throat> are embracing the concept of asset management over maintenance. They are embracing technology and analytics to help them improve the results they're getting. Um, you know, some companies uh, are even developing uh, what are deemed reliability centers of excellence to help them improve and leverage, um, you know, en enhancements and improvements across the entire organization. Um, many of them don't even use the term maintenance anymore. So I think that's something we've got to think about uh, in this space and, and really change the thinking and, and maybe even change the terminology that we're using to describe what we do. Um, an example of thinking differently about the traditional cost center uh, of maintenance is, is really the idea of having a skilled technician, maintenance technician, um, really being responsible for not just the maintenance activities, but also possibly even the operation of the of the uh, the equipment itself. You know, in, in a typical uh, cost accounting mindset, that would come across as being crazy. It's expensive, and labor costs more, and that's a that's not a good option, but I'll tell you, we have done this, and it can really be a game changer. If a highly skilled operator, in this case, maybe a maintenance technician that, that we combine some roles on with, with an operator, can increase throughput, if they can improve reliability uh, of the asset, um, the returns can be quite substantial. As we saw in one of the charts earlier, uh, operator error accounts for 11% of unplanned downtime, according to the survey respondents. I would say in some situations it could be significantly higher than that. You know, if both the operating performance and reliability can be improved with a move like this, and you know, the small increase in, in labor costs can become relatively insignificant. In several plants today, we're working with our customers to, to really go beyond simply maintaining the equipment. We're really trying to expand the role of of maintenance and, and getting into looking at things like quality, looking at throughput, uh, all those things that, that are common if you if you utilize OEE in your facility as a, as a key metric. Uh, it's, it's really created some very different thinking for us and for our customers, and it's created some, some really good results. So, um, and Jeff, I'm gonna apologize. I know that was a pretty long-winded long answer, but uh, those, are, those are some thoughts that were in my head as I, as I looked at this trend. Well, it's a complex uh, subject, Jim. It really is, and and I think you're right. You know, we have to look at this through many different facets, and um, you know, all too often, you know, there's there's primary objectives and there's um, <laughs> several others. And I think, um, you know, you hit the nail on the head as you kind of walked us through that. And just to summarize, you know, some of the things we just talked about here, um, relative to some of these key initiatives, again, you got to find a balanced approach and. 
you know, as we look at this, and, and I know there's a lot of reliability engineers on the call today, you know, looking at, at the industrial automation and state of technology today, and it's it, it's both an art and a science, I think. And, you know, we've got to focus on that and understand some of the trends that are going on and, and take advantage of those. Um, leveraging supply chain, um, I think that's important. You know, you talked about the importance of things like training, you know, and, and a lot of people don't have um, curriculums and ways to, to immediately train folks, you know, whether it's safety training or technical training. And then from a supply chain perspective, you know, sometimes your maintenance group is only as good as the industrial parts at hand. So making sure you've got, a, you've got connectivity to both your, your, your maintenance organization and the industrial parts strategy as well. And then last, but certainly not least, is, is getting cost out. And, you know, when we, we, we talk to lots of manufacturing customers, and, and I've done lots of customer focus interviews through the years. And, you know, it's really two facets of this. You know, first, you've got to have transparency into the data and, and see exactly uh, what the true cost is. And then once you understand that true cost of maintenance, or as we call it, the cost buildup, um, you've got to take everything into consideration, and it's it's some of the training that we talked about here. It's the PPE that the folks have to to use every single day, uh, uniforms, tools, etc. So, really uncovering that true cost of maintenance um, is is critical in, in getting some of that cost out. And we're going to our uh, third and final topic here with an eye on the clock. Um, we're going to talk about some of these implications. So we've talked a lot about some of the challenges and the opportunities that are in front of us here. And we're going to take a couple of minutes. We're going to talk about some of the implications for maintenance and reliability services. And we're going to kind of frame out our responses here around um, kind of the advanced manufacturing and, and technology areas. And once again, Jim's going to talk about a couple of the uh, survey results that came in, you know, relative to this topic here and, and, um, and, and give you some, some more thoughts around those topics. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up. So, Jim, maybe you can talk about the uh, first piece of data here again. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the thing that kind of jumps off the page at me is I'm surprised that that safety uh, didn't didn't really make this list. Uh, it is certainly an area where we have applied some of the technology to to help make our folks safer and, and make working on the equipment safer. Uh, but that said, um, you know, one really interesting example of that we have firsthand experience with uh, around this, all, all the new technology in IoT is we had a, a current customer of ours who approached us as they were they were looking to build a new kind of manufacturing plant. Their vision was, uh, I think, kind of that ideal high-tech vision of, of having a plant that didn't require any machine operators. Uh, so we sat down and collaborated with them, and, and we really went through a process to redefine the functions of the normal operator function, uh, setup functions and maintenance functions and, and those kind of things. And what we have today is we have a plant where, you know, our team, which is traditionally thought of as a maintenance team, we are operating, tending the equipment, we're making sure material is flowing, we're making sure AGVs uh, are carrying material through the plant. If they have to stop and get reset, our folks do that. Uh, but we're also keeping an eye on quality. And their engineers uh, are really uh, operating, uh, not operating, but running and managing the plant um, um, from a from a central uh, control room, it, it's really an impressive setup. And you know, I would just say uh, technology is is it's so impressive what's available in the market today. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and transition to the next slide and kind of look and see how um, how respondents say they're going to manage maintenance in the plants today. But certainly a, a great time, and we've got access to more technology than we've ever had. Um, you know, I, I don't know about the folks on the call, but um, these results to me are, are really pretty surprising. Um, you know, I, I'm I think of the the old adage of if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, and, and maintenance data obviously is is very crucial. Uh, it, it's shocking that that 50% of respondents are, are using a CMMS uh, to manage their maintenance, and and also 46% are are still relying on paper records. Um, you know, I, I can tell you. From our perspective, there is no way we could operate our business and deliver the results that we do to our customers without good systems and real-time analytics. Obviously, we've got great people, but those are, are critical aspects. Um, you know, there, there's there's really no way if if you're running or, or responsible for a maintenance organization today that that you can drive improvements without some of these key metrics and systems. Um, you know, I don't think this slide needs much more discussion. 
So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Um, you know, th this slide talks about advanced technologies and capturing of, of machine data and, and what folks are seeing out there. Um, you know, when I look at this kind of information, I'm reminded of a quote that uh, that I've read that has has really stuck with me for a long time. And uh, this gentleman, uh, I'll give you his title. His title is Enterprise Infrastructure Architect and IoT Lead. So he's smack in the middle of the, of all this uh, technology initiative that's going on. And uh, this is what he said about it. He said, the advice I'd give any organization is first and foremost, understand the problem. Fall in love with the problem and not the solution. He goes on to say, once you understand the problem, look to partner with somebody who can bring future rich, not feature rich, solutions. Um, this gentleman happens to be with Rolls Royce. Uh, it, it's a quote I think that's very appropriate in, in this technology space and uh, I'm sure there's a, a lot of other perspectives and opinions on that. So uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up with that, Jeff. Hey, thanks, Jim. You know, and it's um, <laughs> it's hard to encapsulize everything that's happening, you know, across the, the technology spectrum and manufacturing here in just a few minutes. But um, but I think those are some some um, certainly words of wisdom there. And I and I appreciate the quote that you provided there from the gentleman at Rolls Royce. I think that rings true for for a lot of people out there today. Um, as we wrap up this final section here and then get to some Q and A, um, just a critical insight that jumped out again here. You know, again looking at maintenance services that are outsourced. Um, and the ones that take advantage of these new technologies, again, we see a bit of a trend here. You know, over the, the, the past five years, we've seen that go up a few points. Um, do you, Jim, do you expect this trend to continue? Yeah, Jeff, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we, we see it for all, the, for all the, the challenges and the issues that we, we've talked about already. And, and obviously, the, the study has a lot more uh, meat on the bone here than what we've covered today. But, you know, I do believe whether it's a, it's a wholly turnkey outsource solution or if it's um, you know, just partnering with somebody on, on certain aspects of your maintenance strategy, I absolutely see that's going to that's gonna continue. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I, I think you're correct on that. And um, as, we, as we wrap up this section here, um, you know, I, I think, again, finding a balanced uh, approach to these maintenance uh, implementations are, are key. And, you know, when you look at the topic of this webinar, and it's really, you know, the cross-section between the human and workforce component and the technology component, um, these, these are just key areas that I think are going to be uh, table stakes for everybody moving forward. You know, advancing the skills of, of the workers is key. Uh, redefining roles, and, and Jim, you had said maybe uh, 10 or 15 minutes ago, you know, the, the way roles are defined and the way that maintenance teams are structured uh, today and in the past few years are going to change, and it's probably going to change for pretty dramatically. And then, of course, embracing the technology once you identify that and the cost structures that surround it. So thank you very much for, for your input. Um, we're going to finish up this area here and then get to some Q&A. Um, you know, just in terms of partnering with the maintenance provider, and we talked about this uh, towards the beginning of the webinar, um, you know, we look at this from a couple different angles, and, and Jim had alluded to a couple of the, the uh, service-based offerings that we have. We've got several customers who use us uh, for more of a short-term maintenance, uh, I guess you could say, it could be project-based or sometimes emergency-based. And, you know, they really need folks who are, from a workforce perspective, going to react quickly to downtime and, uh, and minimize some of that direct cost relative to maintenance. Uh, and then we have a lot of folks who are interested in more of a, a long-term maintenance model where uh, reliability-centered maintenance is key, you know, and you're looking at long-term asset management there. And uh, I really like how Jim focused in on that, um, the topic of predictable capacity. And, and I think when we hear that from numerous customers, you know, that's a signal to us that uh, we have to get as meticulous as we can to make sure that um, that uptime is there and that they're producing at full capacity. And then one other thing I wanted to mention, um, you know, as we uh, go through this, this uh, COVID-19 crisis, um, you know, we've got call centers and we've got folks at the ready uh, doing remote maintenance support. Um, we've got subject matter experts, a lot of our own reliability engineers, who are at the ready to help our customers and other folks across the industry with, um, with any issues they have relative to, to production maintenance. So I just wanted to let folks know that that service is available. We have some resources and links we're going to talk to in a couple minutes here, but, um, but it's really the hub that Jim talked to before. 
And it creates a forum between us and, and those manufacturers out there who need some help quickly. Uh, and this pertains to not only uh, production equipment maintenance and troubleshooting, but also to industrial part services. You know, we talked about the fact that uh, sometimes the maintenance team is only as good as, as the parts at hand. Um, and, and we do have uh, an industrial part services group who uh, do both parts repair uh, in case of emergency and a uh, supply chain group that can also source hard to find parts quickly. So um, just wanted to make folks aware of that. And then last but not least, we included some resources and links here. Um, everybody, my understanding is gonna get a copy of this presentation here. So there's links out to uh, not only the study uh, and the full, the full results that came from it, but both some, some short-term and, and long-term strategies and services from ATS, as well as some of our other partners. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kevin for some Q&A. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, don't go away because as you mentioned, we're gonna have time for at least a couple of questions. And I do want to note that questions that we do not get to today will be posted online with the archive version of the webcast. And as Jeff mentioned, to download a certificate of completion, the presentation and other resources, use the event resources tab on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, Jeff, I'll, I'll direct my first question to you and then I'm sure Jim will join in uh, if he wants to add anything. And, you know, it was just amazing the amount of experience the veteran uh, maintenance workers and managers in industry have. But, but you know, you can't escape the, the reality that some of those people are going to be leaving uh, over time from the industry and enjoying their retirement. What kind of a solutions do you foresee for um, the transition of those experienced and knowledgeable workers being replaced by some who may have uh, a, a, a lot of technology know-how, uh, but don't have the same experience as that older generation? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Kevin. Um, you know, when you look at organizations today, I think they need to get more comfortable um, hiring people who need some development. You know, the, sometimes the easier, the easier out is to get those folks who are heavily experienced. Um, but I think, you know, those organizations have to get more comfortable with that. Um, hiring those inexperienced people that have good aptitude, uh, they're willing to learn. Um, and as we talked about um, in the beginning of the call, you know, culture. And, um, you know, I, I've uh, heard a quote for many, many years, um, cultural lead strategy every day. So finding those people that really fit the culture of the organization is going to be key. Uh, Jim, I don't know if you have any other, any other thoughts around that question. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great point, Jeff. I, I also think another thing that, that manufacturers can do is utilize some of the experience you have from senior level technicians or possibly even some folks who have recently retired. but but still want to <clears throat> put some hours in, um, they can be fantastic mentors and, and they can really help bring along some of those new folks. So I would encourage you to consider how you could put together a mentorship program for, for those folks from, uh, from your plant and, and help the new folks that you're going to hire. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Jim, a second question for you. There's a lot of emerging technologies in the area of process optimization, and some of those are also being used in the reliability area. One of the most fascinating would be machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. And with machine learning, you're using pattern recognition to learn from data um, to identify process anomalies, either in optimization or reliability. How do you see machine learning getting incorporated into maintenance procedures and what do you think the future is for it? No, I like that question. That's a good one. Um, I, I would say um, there, there's a ton of information out there about AI and machine learning. Some of it, I would say, maybe more aspirational and futuristic, uh, but there's certainly no shortage of it. Uh, as I go to these conferences, I see a lot more software providers and people looking at bringing those kind of solutions to market. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the developers, I would say, and the marketers of this kind of technology are, are really stating that technology is going to create the next industrial revolution. I'm not sure I'm quite that, that uh, positive on it, but, you know, for the more pragmatic folks, the adoption of this technology uh, is really going to 
um, take a little bit longer. Um, it's going to evolve, and things like IT security is going to create some challenges, and things around people being resistant to adopt the technology is going to be a challenge. So, um, but but all that said, uh, I think it's going to be a huge influencer, and that's probably where we're going to see more development on the technology side is in that software and analytics space over the next couple of years. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Jeff, the final question from today's webinar I'll address to you. And we talked a lot during the course of the webinar about uh, training as a way to improve retention of employees. Uh, what other kinds of uh, programs do you see being used by your clients or by ATS itself to uh, retain qualified personnel? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Kevin. Um, um, pr pretty broad, but I'd say, you know, a lot of times folks uh, believe that compensation is going to be key there. Um, but I, I'm not sure if just increasing wages is going to solve that problem entirely. You know, that's, that's a, of course, a component, uh, but it really won't fix retention. You know, I think when you look at this problem, you've got to look at it personally. You know, what, what kind of personal uh, needs do folks have? Um, professionally, where are they professionally in their career, and can you give them that career path forward? And then, of course, financially does come into play. Um, but you know, it's been my experience: people don't don't leave companies; they leave poor leaders or poor organizations that, that don't have the right culture. So, I think if you if you focus in on those key components, um, those folks are going to feel respected. You're going to retain them, and you know, as we talked about, skilled technicians are are hard to come by. Um, you don't want to lose them. And, and they're certainly no different than other folks within the organization. So I, um, that would be my, my response. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, that's really all the time we have for today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our attendees for their great questions and their attention. I'd also like to thank uh, Jim and Jeff for uh, a really well-paced, uh, uh, content-filled presentation. And then finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Advanced Technology Services, for sponsoring today's event. Uh, now that we're just about done, we'd like to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Plant Engineering and Advanced Technology Services, I'd like to thank you for attending. That concludes our webcast, and we'll see you next time.